Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, um, and welcome uh, to this workshop on tackling online hate speech, a multi-stakeholder approach. My name is Sabrina Forb. I'm very delighted to share you through today's workshop. This workshop is organized by the InSafe Network, which is the network of safer internet centers across Europe, in cooperation with the Federal Ministry of Justice and Consumer Protection in Germany. In this regard, I would like to thank already um, Dr. Alexander Schäfer from the Ministry for the great collaboration um, following the workshop merger in the past months. This workshop will run for 90 minutes. We will kick off with a 30-minute uh, panel discussion, hearing from policymakers, practitioners, and also industry representatives about the efforts that have been put in place to tackle hate speech online. In this regard, I'm delighted that I've been joined on stage by Mr. Thomas Blönig. He's the head of subdivision at the Federal Ministry of Justice and Consumer Protection in Germany. Um, Mr. Chan Yo Yun, he's an advocate and IT lawyer. Ms. Ingrid Bonik, who is a journalist and author. Sabine Fang from Google. And um, Dr. Mark Jan Eumann, who is the director of the Media Authority of Rheinland Platinate, the vice chairman of the Commission for Protection of Minors in the Media and the coordinator of the Safer Internet Center in Germany. You may also see um, on the slide that um, we were supposed to be joined as well by Mr. David Kay, who is the UN Special Rapporteur on the Promotion and Protection of the Right to Freedom of Opinion and Expression. Unfortunately, um, due to last minute emergency, he is not able to join us, but he obviously sends his <laughs> warm regards. Following this panel discussion, you will be able to discuss amongst yourself as we will host four different table discussions with also different stakeholders in the field to discuss different aspects and ways to tackle hate speech online. However, with any further ado, I'm happy to hand over to Mr. Dr. Mark Jan Eumann for a short welcome. Please. Thank you very much, Sabrina. Um, the estimated speakers of a high level panel, dear table leaders and youth ambassadors in the break out groups, dear remote participants from countries around the world, dear audience and participants of our workshop here at an early hour at the IGF in Berlin, a warm welcome to you all. Hate speech is not a new phenomenon. It is old and familiar as the formation of human societies and the organizations of people into groups. New is that with the digitalization of our global communication opportunities and networks, online hate speech is tremendously increasing in an often unprotected, uncontrolled, unmoderated, and unregulated environment. The freedom of speech is one of the principal pillars of our modern, liberal, and open societies. And I think that we all agree that this is one of the biggest achievements and treasures which we all should work on to protect and guarantee. However, to avoid destructive and insidious impact, hate speech can seriously inflict on our societal cohesion. Clear action and guidance are needed. More than 3,000 participants from all around the world, from different nations, cultures, religions, climate zones, are coming together to just speak up, to meet and exchange their views on the online society. The global multi-stakeholder approach of the IGF is unique and guarantees the diversity we are all living in. Hate speech 
is like a cancer in this colorful environment. It is a threat to democracy. How can we tackle hate speech is a big question. Who is and who should be responsible to counteract online hate? The issue is huge, and media literacy plays a prominent role. But my message is short and simple. I think we need both regulation and education. Mr. Bloing, Germany was piloting with the Law Enforcement Act in 2017. A whole bunch of measures against hate speech was adopted by the cabinet just one month ago. You will give us an update of the legal scenario and the globally controversial debated Law Enforcement Act. I may add that we from the State Media Authority of Rhineland Palatinate are not only educating young people, but we are also prosecuting haters and perpetrators with our initiative for Folgen and Löschen, that means prosecuting and deleting. I'm very delighted that you join us on this panel. And Mr. Chan has been the attorney at law in one of the most prominent cases in recent times when you were representing at Kurt, a Syrian refugee versus Facebook. This got high attention in the public, and we are very happy to have you here, and I'm curious to follow your words on the case. From our neighboring country, Austria, I would like to welcome Ingrid Brodnick, a journalist from Vienna. Your country already wrote history in the social media jurisdiction with the Max Frames versus Facebook case in the decision of the European Court of Justice. You've just told us about your problems actually dealing with the um, decision of the European Court of Justice, so we're very interested to hear about this um, uh, immediately. So you are somehow, per definition, a very special expert, and we're grateful to have you here. And last but not least, and very close to me, Sabine Frank from Google, also a warm welcome to you, and we are very enthusiastic what you would like to tell us about the responsibility of one of the major global tech companies. I would also warmly welcome our table leaders who will activate and conduct our discussions, Barbara Jassy and Carolyn Silbernagel from the Anti-Hate Initiative Das Netz, Catherine and Jayo, the voice of the young people from the Youth Ambassadors, I very much welcome Ricardo Campos from Brazil, uh, who is an expert on online legislating, doing research in Frankfurt and Sao Paulo, and he's just told me about his soft approach on this issue, and Sofia Rosgado, our colleague from the Portuguese Safer Internet Center. Let's have a vivid discussion. Welcome you all. Thank you very much, Dr. Eumann, for these very warm welcome words. Um, as you said, indeed, um, online hate speech is a very growing phenomena. Even though hate speech as such isn't something new, if we look back in history, it always existed. But obviously, with the growth of the internet and latest technologies emerging, it is much more viral, present, and widespread. In um, order to take according measurements, in June 2017, the German government put the Network Enforcement Act in place, uh, which requires social networks with more than 2 million registered users here in Germany to exercise a local takedown of obvious illegal content within 24 hours after notification. Where the legality is not obvious, the provider normally has put has up to seven days uh, to decide on the case. Mr. Bloink, uh, could you please tell us a little bit more about the Network Enforcement Act and also what it has achieved in the past two years? Well, uh, thank you very much, first of all, for, for the invitation to contribute to this interesting discussion. Um, I think starting off with the net Network Enforcement Law, the NetsDG as it's called, um, I think is a little bit short I think I would like to start with a general picture, and I think that's something what you already described, but I think it's always to remind ourselves in what, what kind of atmosphere we are in at the moment. And I think if you look around yourself and if you, if you look at online discussions, we, I think we have to state, first of all, online discussions are key for democracy, are very good for getting people into discussions, into political discussions and social discussions, but online discussions also may lead to aggressive, abusive, and hateful discussions. Now, this is something I think we have to accept as a starting point for, for all the measures we have to think about and have to consider, either regulation, soft law approaches, or other discussions we have to put in place. And I think everybody, everybody in this room, and I myself as well, they can suffer 
as a result of opinion, skin color, social background, religion, gender, sexuality, everything is possible as discrimination in online discussions. That, is, that was the starting point when we looked at any kind of regulations which we might put in place. And as said before, I think freedom of speech is, key, is the cornerstone of every democracy. Um, but freedom of speech ends there where criminal law steps into the place. Uh, and I think that, that was the fine line we had to draw when we had to look at new regulation um, in, in Germany. The starting point of the concept of the net network enforcement law, as I would call it, roughly in, in English, um, was that social networks have to assume greater responsibility. That's the one side. And, but that's not the only side. I think, on the other hand, also state authorities have to take more responsible responsibilities to ensure that victims are protected and there is some effective, um, effective enforcement. Now, looking at the bigger picture, let's say the international picture, we have to note that we have two developments uh, to note. The one is on the UN level, and I think this is one of the places where we should always cite what is going on on the United Nations level. Uh, we have in May 2019 of this year, the UN Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, who presented the UN strategy and plan of action on hate speech. And at the G7 level, the French presidency made a proposal for, um, for a charter for a free, open, and safe internet, which was signed not only by governments, but also by the networks, and also by civil organizations. This is important, I think, to set the picture for any kind of discussion about regulation. Um, you see that something is growing, something is moving, uh, and our aim for the network enforcement law was then to be part of this big, bigger picture, which is, I think, a, I would say a multifunctional framework which has to be set up. Now what is, now I come to my point, I think, uh, but I think it was important, I think, for me to describe this picture uh, where we started off with the Network Enforcement Act. Now, what, what is in the Act? Um, first of all, it applies to large social networks offering a broad range of topics with more than two million registered users in Germany. That's the starting point. Um, and the second one, which is, I think, one of the most important starting points, is that we're dealing with criminal content. We're not dealing with every kind of discrimination in online discussions. We are dealing with criminal law. And the question, is it possible that on, in online discussions there, there are online hate crimes uh, which, which are not prosecuted? And I think that was, that was the line where we said, yes, let's concentrate on the criminal law area. Uh, so what are the, the, um, the offenses which are in a set of a set of rules uh, which are the basis for any kind of compliance system which has to be put in place by the networks. Some examples are public incitement to crime, forming criminal or terrorist organizations, incitement to hatred, distribution of child pornography. These are just one, some of the very serious crimes which we have to put in, which we had put into the law. Now what is the consequence? If you fall under this regime, you are a big social network, there are some contents which may be criminal. First of all, these large networks must have some kind of reporting procedures. So there, there should be the possibility to raise a complaint to the social network. So the social network has to look at this complaint and then it has to s decide within 24 hours if there is a manifest illegal content which is violating German criminal law, that it has to be removed if all other unlawful content, as you said, is the time limit is seven days, and even beyond that, there are cases which are very uh, difficult where the, um, where the uh, social network has even more time to look at the content. This is not to delude our aim to fight criminal content. This is just to find a, a fine balance of freedom of speech and the question of criminal prosecution and the question how do, how do we get criminal content out of discussions. And the second thing is to, to get this balance right was the reason why we introduced some transparency requirements in the law. So the no, these social networks which are under the law have to report on a six-month basis 
in transparency reports about what is going on with the complaints, how many complaints have been raised, and what has been done with the complaints. Now, as examples, I had a look at the, uh, the last 2018 reports. Facebook reported 1,460 complaints. 377 cases were deleted. Um, now, this is probably a very low number. I'll come back to that one. Uh, but YouTube, for example, had 250,000 complaints. And um, complaints led to about 50,000 um, deletions, which is a rate of about 20%. And Twitter has a, a very comparable rate, uh, although they led only to uh, an average of 9% uh, deletion. Um, now, this, this whole compliance system, which has, be, has to be put in place, is under um, a sanction system. Um, the Federal Office of Justice in, in Bonn is responsible for enforcing this. And there has been recently one fine against Facebook, which is based basically on this question, how many complaints have to be reported is, was this right? This uh, complaint, uh, this fine has been uh, imposed in, uh, in summer and is now under um, court revision. Now, what is what is the further development of the Enforcement Act? We have actually two bigger topics which have to be, which will lead to changes in the network enforcement law. The, one, the first one is we have the European Audiovisual Media Services Directive, which covers video sharing platforms. Uh, that introduces a right for re-examination and uh, out-of-court dispute resolution. That has to be put in place anyway. The se but the second thing is we have to look at what kind of experience we have with the Network Enforcement Act, and there may be probably additional changes as well. The second bigger project is that what it has been mentioned before is um, the, um, the bigger package um, passed by the cabinet to fight uh, right extremists. Um, we had two very prominent cases uh, where the internet had a, a not very good role, I think. The one is an attack on a senior regional politician who has been murdered in his garden. Uh, and there has been some campaigning before that in the internet. And the second one is the, I think, known attack uh, on a synagogue in Halle, where there was anti-Semitic manifestos and um, uh, a person who broadcasted the whole act online. Now, these are just two examples, and we see that these are attacks on political representatives, also on with a political objective, and that is the reason why we, uh, why the cabinet decided that we have to increase the role of social networks in prosecution. Um, so the aim is to make, in specific cases, the social networks report. Um, automatically to the prosecution that there has been some deletion of criminal content. Now, I just re reiterate that one. It's criminal content which has to be prosecuted and that should be, as an information, go to uh, the prosecution side. So we don't only want to delete, but we also want to prosecute. Uh, and I think that's something which is missing at the moment, that victims probably see that the information are deleted but there's not really a prosecution in place. And that is something we want to, want to change. I think that, that's, I think, enough and already much too long. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much for this very elaborate explanation of um, yeah, this very uh, important law. So we have heard a bit uh, on the policy side and now would like to go to Mr. Jung, who is obviously in the practice field. And as Dr. Eumann said, you were involved in quite a popular case, um, at least here in Germany it was quite popular, because um, you defended a refugee who took a, a selfie with um, our Chancellor, um, Angela Merkel, and yeah, um, he received quite uh, a lot of hateful messages after this uh, picture got published. Maybe you can tell us a bit of, about this case. I would love to, thank you. Is it okay if I walk around? I can speak better Absolutely. when I'm not sitting. Hi, my name is Chan Zhou. I am a lawyer for IT law. I run a law firm in Bavaria with 10 lawyers, and in our pro bono practice, uh, we represent victims of hate speech, but also users who were, well, victims of overblocking. When I first used the internet in the early 90s, when I was 17 years old or something like that, the biggest annoyances of the internet were probably copyright infringements or spam, and both did not bother me very much at that time. And I thought, well, it's good to have all these liberties, and governments should stay out of it because they will not understand it anyway. 
Well, 25 years later, something has happened in between, I'll skip to that, a young man contacted me, Anas Mudamani, because he had become well known because he took a picture with Angela Merkel in September 2015. And his picture had since then, so between uh, September 15 and December 16, been used for every terrorist attack or crime committed by a refugee. Because people were saying, well, not just any, some refugee committed the crime or set bombs in Brussels, but it was that refugee that took the selfie with Angela Merkel and see how, where it took us, um, what idiot Angela Merkel was to take a picture with this person. So Anas Monamani was afraid of his life because he had always been pictured as a terrorist or a murderer, as someone who has tried to set a homeless person on fire in a subway station here in Berlin. And Anas Monamani at that time was working at McDonald's. He could not go into hiding, even though he tried outside. He put a scarf around his face or something like that because he was afraid to be attacked by someone. And because he found out that this will not stop, he was one of the victims who was actually willing to go to court with the case but because it has not happened just once, but many, many times. Um, he had been accused of setting bombs in fire, making a terrorist attack in Würzburg, in uh, other uh, Breitscheidplatz, uh, he was pictured with that, with his, and always his, his healthy was taken. But whenever he reported the picture to Facebook, they would do nothing. Facebook said, this does not violate our community standards. And when we took the case, we thought, well, this is an easy case. This is a clear case. We don't have to argue about freedom of speech because this is a factual statement. Uh, someone says in writing, um, he took a self, he took, I have the picture with me. Fortunately, thanks to the NetCG, it's not online anymore. Um, it reads, Obdachlosen angezündet, Merkel machte 2050 Selfie mit einem der Täter. Homeless person set on fire, Merkel took a selfie with the perpetrator. And when we reported that to Facebook, the law was on our side because uh, libel, slander, defamation is an illegal criminal offense. It's not a civil case, it's a criminal case. But Facebook said it does not violate our community standards and they were right. Until today, defamation is not covered by Facebook's community standards. And Sabine, yes, we're talking about Facebook today. Community standards of Google are different to that. And um, I always mention Google to, to explain people that it could be different uh, if we wanted to. So, but Facebook made the decision that they said, well, what do we do about nudity? We outlaw it because it will not, it will, um, uh, it, not improve our reach, we will lose users, but as for hate speech and defamation, um, they made the decision to keep it legal on Facebook <laughs> unless certain uh, um, protected groups were affected by that. But uh, in this case, community standards were not affected and we had to take this case to court. And so Anas Modamani filed um, a preliminary injunction, that's what it looked like, and that's one of that one over there. And what came out after that in 2017 was that we lost the case, actually. The court said, well, Facebook claimed it would need a wonder machine to track hate speech, to find this picture everywhere, because we have so many billions of users and new postings. And the judges said, well, whew, we are not experts in technology. Maybe it's true, maybe it's not. Uh, we cannot decide the case. Let's hand it back to the lawmakers and you should give us some law to tell us what to do with the cases. And they did. Just a few weeks after that, um, the uh, Ministry of Justice introduced the first draft of the Network Enforcement Law, which was highly criticized at that time because people were afraid about overblocking and the limitation of freedom of speech at that time. And that's something we have to talk about. But for Anas Modamani, this was the first chance for him to get this picture taken off the networks through the Network Enforcement Act. If I report this picture through the regular uh, reporting systems of Facebook, it will still remain online. But if I report it over NetsDG, uh, then it will be taken down. So community standards are different from law because community platforms make different decisions on what they want to have online and what not. So I believe 
we should not leave it to the communities or the platform themselves. We have regulations, we have laws for good reasons. For some reason, we decided to protect dignity of man, protect personality rights, protect, protect minorities. And these interests may not be the same of platform um, uh, drivers. So I believe lawmakers and regulators should play a more active role. Now, that's not what I said. That was a quote by Mark Zuckerberg. He handed the mandate over to the lawmakers, and here we are. In the second case, I would like to mention just very briefly, and I think I'm probably over my time anyway, um, we also represent people who were affected by overblocking, who had been blocked, whose account was blocked for 30 days because they said something commented on um, on a post which Facebook considered to be a violation of community standards, even though courts said it was perfectly legal. But Facebook fought vigorously to defend the uh, community uh, content decision there. And it took us one year to get a court decision to find out that the comment was not illegal, but it was covered by freedom of speech. So we can say uh, we were successful then, but it took us one year and that's just incredible because no one would ever go this way again to invest these resources and have uh, an account re uh, opened after one year. Of course, she was already released from um, uh, Facebook prison after 30 days, so it was just a um, matter of principle in the end. So what we do need in a second version or third version of the Network Enforcement Act is a better protection for users to um, claim their rights for freedom of speech. This is something that was criticized in 2017, and overblocking was not caused by the NetsDG, but NetsDG has not solved the problem, but it could. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Yun, for um, sharing a bit of uh, the practices and also highlighting yeah, the thin line between um, yeah, what is online hate speech and what is freedom um, of expression. We'd like to go to uh, Mrs. Brodnik, um, who's a journalist, and you have obviously following the policy side, but also the headline and the different cases, and also looked into the topic of online ethics. So based on the two statements you've heard, maybe you can elaborate on your side. Let me start with an example, uh, the example of an Austrian journalist co called Corinna Milborn. On Facebook Messenger, a man wrote to her, uh, I translated it roughly. Um, he was very upset and he wrote, I wish you will be attacked on your way home by a horde of wild Africans. Then you will understand what is going on or maybe you will be, we will be rid of you, which would even be better. The post was much longer than that, but you get the point. So she was threatened with rape, and this user was wishing her that she would die. And she did something most people who get such messages don't do. Um, she wrote back, and she got the address of this person, and she visited him. And she, um, so she was standing in front of this nice little family home at the outskirts of Vienna. It was a middle-class home, very beautiful, rather idyllic. And there was this man, a very ordinary Austrian, who has written this, who was clearly upset. And they found out he was upset because he had read the, the news story that um, some Africans had raped a woman in Vienna. And the police covered it up, and the media organizations were not allowed to write about it. And I guess you are already thinking about this. This story was made up. It was a fake story. It was um, completely wrong. But he believed that. And it is a rare case where somebody really visits a person and can show, come on, this is not true. And the good thing is he believed her. But you know, we cannot visit every person at home which writes such a things or read. We even don't know who everybody who reads such things. And what you see is it's often not like the traditional, um, like common far right um, people or the very common people who would produce hate speech earlier on. It's often ordinary citizens which get more and more aggravated and by reading such stories, for example. 
And I think we just don't also don't just need to talk about takedown, like how to take down certain words, uh, or how to punish people for illegal criminal posts. I think we also need to talk about the mechanisms of platforms. Because, for example, we know that um, anger-inducing content has better numbers. Um, angry people click more, by which I mean there was a good study by the poli political scientist Timothy Ryan in the United States. He um, published political ads on Facebook, and he saw that political ads which induced anger had more than double the amount of clicks than other political ads. So it's a good strategy to put anger in using content online. People will click, will comment, will like. And there's the danger that today's algorithms are built in a way that they even make such content more successful. Because, for example, when we know at Facebook when you, a post has many likes, many comments, it will have a higher chance to reach a lot of people. The algorithm will probably show it to more people. I mean, the same question is regarding YouTube, for example, which is also which also has important algorithms deciding which video show to show you next or which video to show at the starting page. So um, we also need to talk about the mechanisms there. And the biggest problem here, besides the criminal law aspect, I think is that we ha are lacking transparency regarding the new logics of the most powerful platforms we have ever had in the history of mankind. So this is the one side, and um, I think we should also see hate speech not just as something you shouldn't write. Hate speech is a tool to suppress other people, to suppress the views and the visibility and the opinions of other people. Um, for example, w we see that um, every, every gender, every man, every woman can be a victim of an abusive comments. It can happen to everybody. But there are factors which will make it more likely that you will re really get some severe forms of online abuse. We see that, for example, there is a gender difference. Um, the Pew Research Center found out that four in 10 Americans say they have um, experienced online abuse. But when you look at the more severe forms, when you ask people, the last time that you received online abuse, was it severe? Women are twice as likely to say, yes, it was severe. When you look at sex, sexist, abusive um, sexual harassment, young women have twice the likelihood to be victims of that than young men. And we have the real danger that certain groups within our society are being silenced. So um, this is not just a fear or a feeling. It's you have, we have numbers backing that up, or numbers that suggest there might be something to it. Just one last study. Amnesty International um, in 2007 asked people, asked women in eight countries if they had experienced online abuse. And those women who said yes, that they had experienced online abuse, they were also asked if it had consequences on them, and one third of the women who experienced online abuse said that they have become more reluctant to talk about certain issues. And I think we must understand online abuse, and especially hate speech, as a method to silence certain groups with aggressive means. And um, for example, for decades now, we have been fighting for gender equality and that women can public publicly voice their opinion without being afraid to be called out, intimidated, or getting rape threats. And these are democratic values we fought hard for, and there's the real danger that we have a new media ecosystem in which such threats and such intimidating comments, which are sometimes illegal, um, are the new normal. And we are actually making steps back in our society. Thank you very much um, also for, for sharing this very interesting cases and you will all have the opportunity obviously to ask questions um, later on. I would like to go um, to Sabine. We have heard of course, um, uh, yeah, um, social media companies and internet service providers need to take more action. So we're obviously very excited uh, to hear your thoughts and maybe you can also respond to the uh, network enforcement law and um, yeah, your opinion, thank you. I understand all of this in five minutes. Um, so thank you for having me here and inviting me. Very excited to, to be here with you. 
Um, there have been so many points raised that it's actually hard to address all of them. Um, I try my best to, to do this. So starting out with responsibility, I think we're all sitting here in the room because we understand that there is a real um, issue at place and we all have our shares to take. Um, to take responsibility. For platforms, just to speak about YouTube, it's also a matter of scale and size. So um, the number might not be new to you. We have 400 hours of new video content every minute. So um, out of these, no, it's even 500, sorry, 500 hours of video content. From the removal side of things, we know that less than 1% of this content is actually either illegal or violating our community guidelines. That doesn't say that it, there is not an issue and we don't need to take up responsibility and scale up our operations. We have done in the past and we will do. I'm just saying that we have to also take this in, into perspective to Ingrid's point. It's not just that voices are suppressed. I think platforms give the chance that um, people who have been suppressed in the past actually have means now to make themselves heard much more than 15 years back. So I think we need to take both sides into uh, consideration. So how do we um, address the topic of responsibility? We have four pillars um, under which we, we do this. So the four pillars are all starting with an R remove, raise, reduce, and reward. So let me very briefly go, especially to the first one, because it, it has the most um, um, connection to our topic today. So remove, obviously, is um, content we found either violating our community guidelines or uh, violating local law. So how, we, how do we find out? We have... Um, we have flagging systems in place. You're hopefully aware that next to each video, you have the possibility to flag content. Next to each comment, you have the possibility to flag content. Um, a lot of people actually use this, which is very good. Then we have trusted flaggers. These are experts in certain fields across the globe who have specialized tools to give us information on content they see uh, violative against our community guidelines, but they also give us information on substance, on subject. So it's very important that we are in a steady dialogue with them because we need to learn. We are not subject matter experts in all these abusive um, behaviors and content. So this is um, very important. And the third topic um, to be named is machine learning. We have invested a lot into machine learning technologies um, to help us Find, um, find problematic and illegal content. This works especially well in the areas of spam, in the areas of child abusive material, and we have made great progress in the area of terrorist content over, let's say, the last year and a half. It is not really the bullet, silver bullet for all types of content, especially in new, more nuanced cases like hate speech, it's very, very complicated, and we are not there yet to actually have machine learning to help us um, detect content, uh, and then after reviewing it, removing it. Um, but for other areas, it's very, um, very like successful. So to coming to the enforcement part, we have 10,000 people across the globe um, who review content and then remove it. Um, just to give you some statistic, what that means in Q2 this year, we have removed 9 million videos. 78% um, of the videos um, have been flagged by machine learning technology. Um, and in 81% of these cases, no human view has been on that video before it has been removed. I think this shows the power where technology can actually help. Uh, we have removed 4 million channels, and we have removed uh, 530 million comments. So there's a huge upscale process we have in place, and I think this is part of what we do. But we also, and this is um, something that has been addressed, it's not only about our community guidelines, but we respect local law as well. Um, so NetCG is the, that example here for Germany, but it's not just in Germany. We do respect local law across the globe where we operate. Um, we have invested 
huge engineering resources to bring the legal complaints form, which we always had. So you could always report illegal content and we reviewed it after local law. So this is not new. We just brought these two forms together. So the flagging flow and the legal removal flow. Um, we have received, um, actually I have updated statistic. We have received 300,000 complaints in the past, so it's not publicized, so it's very new also to you, 300,000 complaints under NetCG, so legal complaints. 77 of these have not been removed. So you also see that we have to take into account that a lot of people just use it. They just click and file complaints. So it's not that easy to just say, well, there has been a click, just remove. No, there are um, trained people who actually look if this violates local law. Uh, so in 23% of the cases, the content has actually been removed. Um, so I think that shows that we do take great respect into the national law. I, I, if I may, I just have two, two comments to be made. And then um, maybe tell you also the the other three R's in the discussions, if I may, because I think it's important not just to reduce or remove content, but also to raise um, authoritative content. So a lot of the hate speech discussions and disinformation discussion can only be countered if we give more visibility to um, um, authoritative sources. So this is what we have strived for and take a lot of um, efforts to be better in this reduce content, borderline content, some of the hate speech content which ignore, ignore, uh, it, um, sets us up is not illegal, but we find, it, um, we find it disturbing anyhow. So here we can help to reduce actually visibility, is happy to talk more about this. And the third one or fourth one is rewards. So unlike a lot of people say, it's not in our interest to hand out um, big chunks of money to people through advertisement about uh, on harassing um, videos. So it's, it's not in our interest. Um, so we see rewarding actually as, and the monetization as a privilege to creators. So they even stricter mechanisms for people who want to monetize content. Um, a last word on NetCG and the, the new ideas the German government has. Uh, I would welcome very much to actually evaluate the current law really um, intensively before we go to new grounds. Um, Self-regulation is one of the key ideas the law has introduced also to tackle hate speech. We have filed an application to set up a self-regulation body together with Facebook almost a year back. It's not up and running because the Office of Justice has not approved so far. So there might be ideas to also improve um, the pace of these mechanisms. Um, on, on, um, on, uh, on the other improving law enforcement, we've always said that this is a very good idea. It's not enough to just take down content. We actually ha need to have improved law enforcement actions. I think we need to look very carefully into the mechanisms here. If we would, and I told you the numbers, if we would forward all the content we deem to be illegal to law enforcement, then law enforcement would have maybe 100,000 cases just from YouTube. Is that something um, they can actually operationalize? And won't we have totally different discussions a year from now if this would be in place? I'm, I don't think this is actually meant, so I think we need to think about what are good mechanisms so we can help law enforcement to take action and on the other hand um, safeguard user rights, <coughs> privacy rights at the same time. So I will stop with Thea, looking forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Sabine. It's um, obviously great uh, to hear that uh, such good progress has been made. Um, but um, as you said, it's not only about takedown, and we have 
heard the keyword before, which is education. And we would like to invite you now um, to discuss amongst yourself. Um, you will be able to um, select between uh, four different group discussions. And um, here you can see on the slide what will be discussed in the different groups. So the first group, um, yeah, we'll talk about children's rights and um, yeah, how are they protected and is the voice of children and young people heard. And I'm very delighted that this group discussion will be facilitated by um, two of our Better Internet for Kids youth ambassadors, um, Katrin and Joao, and I invite them to give a quick wave um, from the back. Um, so if you would like to discuss with them, they are right over there. Um, then we have another um, group who will look in what more can be done in terms of media literacy um, education, and this will be um, facilitated by my colleague Sofia Rascado from the Portuguese Safer Internet Center, who sits over there. Um, a third group will obviously look into the role of the internet platforms, and I'm very delighted that we have Ricardo Campos from the University of Frankfurt, but he also works in Sao Paulo for Logarithm. He sits over there, if you would like to join Ricardo. And a final group, yeah, obviously looks into the cooperation and collaboration on national, regional, but also um, international level to um, counteract hate speech. And we have Caroline Silbernagel from the SNETS sitting over there. You have the chance to discuss now for 20, 25 minutes, then we will come back in plenary, and you obviously get the opportunity to ask our panelists um, questions and also give a feedback to the session. So I wish you a group, very nice group discussion. I invite you all to stand up and find a table facilitator. Thank you. Ja, 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 ich 
Das Netz und haben wir alle Briefings gemacht. Und ich finde, das ist nur eine Bereicherung zum Panel. Ja. Gut, das, das finde ich das Wolle an der Regel anders und anders, weil die Leute kommen und sind auf acht Jahren und können den Ländern von der Regel verstehen. jetzt dabei und sieht, der hat es geschafft, was du bist schon hier sein kannst. Ich auch, ich auch auf ihn das und hier kann ich meine Meinung ganz so unbedingt, wo ich manchmal denke, mein Gott, wenn der reinkommt. Aber es ist voll. So, also.
und dann Sorry, ladies and gentlemen, to disturb you, uh, but I'm afraid we have to come back to the plenary to come to a conclusion of this workshop. Obviously, we hope that you will continue this discussion and all our panelists and also table facilitators will, of course, be um, at the IGF today. Um, we would like to um, hear now back from the table discussions and um, uh, there will be a rotating microphone going around for the table facilitators to briefly summarize about the discussion. I give you the mic then, then you do a very short Okay, we have been joined on stage by um, our youth ambassadors, Katrin and uh, Joao, and your table discussion evolved around the topic of children's rights and what more can be done to ensure that the voice of children and young people heard when it comes to online safety. So please fire out. <laughs> yes, uh, is it working? Okay, yes. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, we had a really um, nice discussion about a um, lot of different things um, concerning children online. And uh, we kind of started with a really interesting point at the beginning that um, we are l talking a lot about the symptoms and not like really the, the exact problem in society. And uh, But I think we kind of got to the conclusion that it's really hard to like totally change the society and we had a think we had a, like um, some good ideas how to make it concrete and what we um, really could do which uh, I think the basic point was um, that a lot of things are about like community guidelines and uh, that we have to work strongly on that and that like all different parts um, of society have to work together on the community guidelines and not only like one plot platform together. Uh, so I'll be, thank you for, for, for this, Catherine. Uh, my name is João Pedro. Um, I'll be actually focusing on the um, recommendations and the actions that we actually discussed. So um, first of all, re related to the symptoms, uh, I think it's, uh, as mentioned, important so that we start connecting the dots. Um, what does this actually mean? that we need concrete ap approaches, for instance, community guidelines in the platforms that the um, young children uh, are using. Why? Um, because sometimes it's actually not clear if uh, we are actually providing or promoting the good content or not. Uh, and uh, we, we are talking about risks, but sometimes not about the opportunities. And a great space to speak about all, both risks and opportunities it's uh, when, we th when we think about the parent relationship with the children. Um, another point that was mentioned was um, the gaming content. So sometimes the negative content is being uh, circulated and promoted by example. Uh, what does this mean? For instance, influencers are doing things that the actually they're not correct or, or not right and we then see people and young children in special uh, to take those examples. And what can we do about this? Well, uh, it was the, actually the last point that we were discussing and something that came up was reaching out to uh, the influencers themselves 
as um, as something that should be done and trying to make him, making them aware of the responsibility that they have in the digital sphere. Also, uh, a very interesting point would be to have a, a kind of age rating system uh, for the content of, that is being circulated in the platforms. Thank you very much. And just yeah. one more thing, and um, I think we all who are talking about ch children online, um, we already talked about like education in schools and not only educate the children, but also like the parents. I think that's something uh, a lot of us talk about like all the time, and we try to uh, wrap our, our hand around how to do that, and that it's more about children maybe like teaching their parents and like older people as well. So I think that's, yeah. Thank you very much. I think that's a good point and also good bridge to um, the second group that um, talked about um, the importance of media literacy education and what more can be done to support um, children and young people. And uh, Sophia, please come up and give us a short summary of your group discussion. Thank you, Sab Thank you Sabrina. So uh, our group, to sum up the discussion that we had, uh, the, the, uh, so uh, the conclusion is that it should be mandatory to have uh, digital literacy in the school curricula and also including uh, the ethical uh, dimension, uh, human rights, um, human rights. And then we also talked about uh, uh, how to reach uh, adults about these questions, the digital literacy, the media and uh, information literacy and uh, that it's not easy and uh, and as uh, as we uh, as we uh, uh, as the network of the safer internet centers uh, we know that it's not it's not it's easy to to reach uh, parents and then uh, greece gave the the example uh, about uh, that they are working on uh, of uh, uh, reaching adults uh, but through the the families uh, so and we also talked about how to reach um, uh, uh, other people uh, and vulnerable people. And uh, it's not easy and we don't have a conclusion about that. I'm sorry. Uh, what more did we talk about? Okay, and that, uh, and uh, did, it's also important not only to focus on the, the media and, uh, and the digital uh, literacy, but it's also uh, good to uh, take uh, uh, in account the, and to teach uh, children the, all, uh, the critical thinking. Mm, that, uh, I think that it was... <laughs> thank you very it's much, all. Sophia, yes. and don't you. worry about not finding any concrete solution. No, this is all why we're here for to discuss and exchange. Thank you very much. Uh, the third group, and we have um, heard this before, um, about internet platforms that they should take more action. And there was a third group facilitated by Ricardo. Please come on stage and uh, give us a short summary about the discussion within your group. So uh, I think it's not fair to, to, to summarize the discussion here because we have really different uh, point of views raised by different peoples, different people around the world. world. And, but, but I would like to put focus in two main questions that we discussed. One was raised by the Italian colleague about, uh, and it's quite related to, you, to your talk, the IT lawyer. So about the, um, the, the, the condition, terms and conditions no, and, and, the, and the importance of that. And the, the comment of the colleague was that if we only took a, uh, take a look on this self-regulation side, maybe we, we lose uh, import points, for example, public interest and so on. And, and I think that's uh, the most important message maybe from Germany for, from the new regulation because it puts in some way a new equilibrium in the self-regulation side and the state side. And, and that, uh, that is the example for us for example, from Latin America, that we are trying to to bring back home. So uh, the message from from Germany. So a new equilibrium between 
uh, platforms and states and uh, public interest. And another question was raised um, uh, about uh, about the free freedom of expression by you, and above all the problem that the compliance and the accountability from the platforms in local scenarios. So how can the platforms be uh, in, uh, in compliance with local laws, local traditions, and not only departing from the tradition of free expression of the US? That was maybe the, the two points that I would like to, to put focus. Thank you very much, uh, Ricardo. And you have mentioned it already. It's obviously um, a multi-stakeholder approach. And this is why we're all here um, at IGF, and especially when we want to counteract hate speech. And this is what the final group discussed. What more can we do to, at national, regional, and also international level to counteract hate speech? And uh, Caroline, please join us on stage for some short takeaways from your um, group discussion. Okay, um, thank you uh, for joining me in, uh, and us in, in this group. It was a very um, a very broad um, community joining there so and very insightful. So I can all only um, share some spotlights of our very broad discussion or like the very broad inputs. Um, so one thing that was brought forward very strongly that is, was that we need an exchange of experience and good and also back practices um, so um, between parliamentarians. Um, and that on an international level. So uh, a lot of uh, countries are moving forward with, uh, with legal action and having that shared on a broader resource, um, not only like the legal tax, but also um, the experience and the, um, the review of it is a very, very important um, aspect that was mentioned um, several times. Same for the legal systems. So the case law that is developing and also um, the qualification of staff, how we can move forward on that is something that we can work on and where uh, collaboration and, and cooperation and, and exchange um, on an international level makes um, very much sense. So we have also the need to, um, so the participants mentioned that we have the need to move forward towards a, uh, an international standard, so um, shared common guidelines that make it easier to, to also interact and to, um, to build accountability towards the, uh, the, the big platforms that act on a global level as well. But also we were um, um, very much aligned that the goal is not to harmonize uh, an international um, yeah, uh, set of laws, but um, to to uh, build on shared principles and a, a shared basis, and then still allow for national and regional diversity, and um, yeah, and and granularity was the word that was used that I liked a lot. Um, so of course, uh, cooperation uh, also should take place on very specific areas. So from uh, knowledge uh, knowledge exchange and. Um, and best practices um, uh, on political advertisement um, to how gender-based um, violence, which is such an important aspect of, of hate speech, can actually be developed in a in a um, in, in a in a legal standard. So this is really ground groundwork. Um, we in many countries we don't have uh, gender-based violence as a legal standard, and to tackle it online, we first have to develop. Um, uh, legal standards to, to allow us to, to counter it. And then uh, self-regulation of platform was, so it's not only a legal or, or legislative uh, field of cooperation, but we have a lot of cooperative activity that has to go on that goes also in, in other uh, stakeholder groups. And all these cooperative aspects need to happen in a, in a multi-stakeholder way. So no single stakeholder group can solve this on, on their own. Um, Finally, so yeah, one last thing, and uh, of course that was something that I, I, I really love to hear. There is a lot of um, ground um, groundwork or like reality check knowledge that is um, in the hand of civil society. So a lot of civil society groups are actually working with uh, with the ones affected by hate speech and can can transfer this uh, this knowledge and this like day to day reality of hate speech towards this uh, the the other stakeholders and that's why we all agreed that civil society voices are very important in all those processes. 
Thank you very much, uh, Caroline, and to all the table facilitators um, for summarizing the discussion. As we're coming to the end of this workshop, we obviously would also like to give you the opportunity to ask questions or share any comments or feedback with the panelists or the table facilitators. So if you have a question, please raise your hand and we will set you up with a microphone. Thank you very much, Wolfgang Benedek, University of Graz. Um, I have a full understanding that it's extremely difficult to deal uh, with uh, content, illegal uh, content in this amount. Uh, but uh, what I miss is a transparency uh, regarding who are the cleaners, or as somebody in our group said, the firemen who are doing this uh, cleaning, on what principles are they doing it, taking into account that we have to deal with different jurisdictions, and uh, what, is, uh, what is the possibility, what are the remedies if you are affected uh, by such blocking, how can you uh, appeal or how can you uh, uh, get such a decision undone if you think it is uh, not correct? Thank you very much. I guess that question is for me. I guess so. <laughs> so thank you for the question. Um, and you're right. It's not easy, actually, to do all of this and so many different jurisdictions. And I think we have to differentiate between our legal operations and com community guideline operations. And um, I can only refer you to the NetCG Transparency Report because we explain, in, we explain there and will even more in more detail in the next one coming out early next year um, who are the people um, looking at the content, evaluating the content. We take a great length into educating these people with external law experts, with law professors, uh, so they're really well-versed in, uh, uh, in German law, because this is what they do. Um, your second question was, um, so what, what happens if your content get re gets removed? You get a notification um, that your content gets removed, and in that notification you have a direct link to an appeals form where you can say, well, actually, you made a mistake, and this is the reason why I believe you made a mistake, and then we will revisit um, this claim. So there's an, like an um, very easy to use process because we, we honor that by the amount of de decisions we have to take, there can be and will be mistakes being taken. So obviously, and we have no, we have no intention of re removing content that is legal, but we have a great, um, uh, we want to remove illegal content very quickly. So there is like this, um, the, this tension between the two of them. But you have means you can counter. Thank you very much, Sabine. I think, Ms. Brodnik, you also wanted to I add. I just wanted to add, um, the professor here is from Austria, so we don't have the net sticky. So the German transparency report doesn't uh, tell us much about the situation in Austria. So the question is, if every country in the world needs to make such a law, um, right, saying what kind of transparency, what kind of numbers regarding content moderation has to be published, or perhaps um, this could be part of the some, something like the Digital Services Act in the European Union, but uh, when you're not living in Germany, you don't have such numbers. I just want to, not the same amount of numbers. So we have a global transparency, YouTube transparency report um, outlining what kind of content is removed, what um, complaints did we give, where, what kind of moderators do we have. So. This is um, not true, actually, so we take a great deal of transparency. We also have a second transparency report um, outlining how many requests we get from law enforcement and how uh, do we like take action against these requests. So please take a look at the global YouTube transparency report and come back with questions to Marco and I if you have further. But you mentioned a very important point. Uh, it's necessary from a European point of view that we have a new Digital Service Act and it will be coming and it must come in because um, it's not good to have uh, different laws in different European countries. So I'm very in favor for having the Digital Service Act and uh, 
uh, right now it's the right time to talk to uh, members of the commission, newly elected commission, uh, to talk about the essential needs uh, of the Digital Service Act uh, for the European single market. Thank you very much. There was one more question just in the front. Yes, please. Or in the back, and then we come to you in the front. Yes, please. Uh, hello, I'm uh, you from Hong Kong, uh, Justin, Free from Hong Kong. Uh, so just want to bring out an example from my school. So uh, a boy, uh, my friend, he posted a photo on Instagram uh, saying uh, selfie instead. It's a selfie. And uh, one of the, uh, his mutual friends or some friends of him uh, commented and say, oh, it, uh, the photo was bad. He's ugly. He's, uh, uh, it's a poor photo, okay? So are these also one kind of hate speech or not? Because to a certain extent, uh, the other owner is just saying out his own opinion. So it's not really, uh, it's, it's just his own words. But uh, maybe he's not really trying to attack uh, the boy but he's just trying to bring out his own thing. Maybe he's a bit harsh, but he's not trying to attack him because they're friends. So are these also kind of hate speeches, or is it just a boy who can't uh, accept the other's opinion and it's a boy's problem or the, the one who commented it? Thank you. Thank you for your question. I think this was a little bit, uh, Mr. Yun, what you explained earlier in your presentation. We have a microphone uh, just there. Maybe you would like to give some feedback. There is a line between criminal content and harmful content. And I think what we will learn in the future is that a lot of things that are harmful, we discussed that with Ingrid, is in the end maybe not criminal. So bullying, cyber mobbing can be harmful but may not be a criminal offense. And of course, this has to be judged by Hong Kong law and not by German law. So we, can, we know a lot of cases uh, where we think, well, this is outrageous what's going on, but it will not fall under NetsDG. Actually, the Network Enforcement Act will only protect us from the most severe criminal cases, while others will have to be dealt not by lawyers. Thank you very much. We are really, really running out of time, but maybe one final question. It better be a very important one. <laughs> so pressure is on you. Hello, um, my name is Alex Brown. I'm a professor in politics, law, and philosophy based in the UK. I'm currently doing a study on behalf of the Council of Europe looking at new innovations in governance of online hate speech. My question was for S Sabina. Um, you mentioned that Facebook and Google in the last year have been applying to set up a self-regulatory institution under the NetsDG um, framework. And you mentioned that this has taken some time. And without throwing anyone under the bus, is the reason for the slowness that they're taking extra care in assessing your application, or in your opinion, is it setting a too high bar? The question probably goes to Mr. Blanc, not me. So I think he's better uh, placed to answer this. Um, I think it's a matter of prioritization. I think it, um, um, so the organization who applied is the self-regulation organization here in Germany, FSM, they're called. So they have been accredited by the Commission of Use Protection for Use Protection. They operate under that framework for more than 10 years, maybe 15 years, so they are well versed into what they do. They have done the same application process 15 years ago, so they know what they're doing. So I doubt that there are actually administrative um, problems in this, and I hope that we see um, action coming very soon, but maybe we hear more positive um, answers. Well, no, de de no definitive answer, but uh, I think it's not always so that if you apply to something that everything is granted immediately. Uh, sometimes authorities think that not all the conditions which are set by law are fulfilled. So we have to get into discussions, I think, which took place, uh, but I think we are on a good route um, to come to an end to that decision, hopefully. Yeah. <laughs> yes, <laughs> as we do. Um, if, if, I, if I may, just a word to the Digital Services Act. I'm very European. I've worked on the European level for a couple of years, but in this area about hate speech and hate crime, I would be a little bit more reluctant about any kind of harmonization. Harmonization is good if you, we look at compliance frameworks, etc., which should all be the same. But when it comes to speech and the question of what is legal or illegal, 
I think that's a different matter. And, and we have to see that member states at least uh, remain a, in a position to, to, well, have some kind of power to um, fight illegal content, even if we have some kind of harmonized framework. So it's, I think it's a, harmonization is good, but I think this is a very special area where we should be very concerned if we just only look at the seat of a company in Europe. So um, I'm a little bit more reluctant on that one, just to make a final word. Thank you very much. Um, originally, I planned to ask all of you to give one takeaway from the session, but I think there are so many. And coming to a conclusion, thank you very much for joining us today. We obviously hope that this discussion will continue. This is what we're all here for. Um, please come and find us in the IGF village at the InSafe booth. We will be there until Friday, so you can continue having this conversation with us. And thank you very much, and have a pleasant day here at the IGF. Thank you. And just just give, me the, give me the opportunity to thank Sabrina. Um, to lead us through this uh, session. Thank you very much for uh, the safely drive through a very uh, important topic. Thank you very much. Thank you.